Uh, so, again, my name is Josh Nelson, current chairman of SEDS USA. I've been asked to keep this introduction as brief as possible, and so while I'm tempted to just read off some of the interesting tidbits about Will that Twitter has come up with in the past five minutes, uh, <laughs> it's important to note that this is the 30th anniversary of SEDS. October 14, 1980 was the first SEDS meeting. So think about that, that you guys are part of 30 years of history of students educating themselves about one of the coolest topics in the universe. And it's right that we have such a distinguished SEDS alumni as Bill Pomerantz to give the traditional SEDS banquet presentation. Mr. Pomerantz is the, currently the Senior Director of Space Prizes for the X Prize Foundation. His duties cover all of the space prizes at the X Prize, but most notably the, if my phone stops turning asleep, $30 million Google Lunar X Prize. Will also holds a bachelor's in Earth and Planetary Science from Harvard University, where he was also an active member of their SEDS chapter. And then graduated with a master's in so of science in space studies from the International Space University. Ryan Colbert, another SEDS alumni, would like to add that in addition to being one of the most kick-ass people at the XPRIZE Foundation, Will is an avid Bullcats fan. <laughs> Without any further ado, William Pomerantz. Thank <laughs> you. 
So here we go. All right, I work at the X Prize Foundation. We're a nonprofit, an educational nonprofit. We are based in Los Angeles, California. Uh, and what we do is we offer big incentive prizes. So, like every other nonprofit in the world, we care about problems on this earth and off. We want to solve them. But instead of solving them by directly paying money to send medicine to Haiti or to pay a researcher to, to find a cure for cancer, instead, we put this huge carrot at the end of a stick and we say, whoever goes out there and does it first or does it best, you win. It doesn't matter how old you are, what degree you have, what your GPA was, if you did it first, you win. If you've heard of us, the first time you heard of us was probably because of this prize, the Ansari X Prize. This was offered up in 1996. It was a $10 million prize for the first privately funded team to, put, uh, to build a station that could put, uh, capable of putting two people in a space two times in two weeks. And for those of you who were alive back then, it's obviously so young, for those that uh, were in the space industry back then, you know that the idea of privately funded space flight in 1996 was a joke. Uh, I, I don't feel bad saying that because it was a joke to me. Uh, I thought it was never, ever going to be one. But thankfully, you've seen the pictures behind me, and hopefully you've seen them all before. I was dead wrong. We had 2016 from seven different countries compete. Uh, best of all, we had someone win. Spaceship One flew three times over the summer and fall of 2004. It made front page news all over the world. It got people excited about space in a new way. And it brought about, uh, not necessarily a new capability, but a capability that had never been and available anywhere near that price point before, and kicked off what uh, people are estimating is about a billion dollar industry right now. That's critical to us. If we do a prize and someone wins it and then says, well, that was fun, I'm never doing that again, that's a failure mode for us. We want to see this. We want to see Spaceship 2 flying. We want to see other vehicles flying. We want it to be the trigger to a new industry. So we did that prize. It worked. Uh, we had originally been created just to do that one prize, but when it worked, we said, well, what the hell? Why are we going to stop? Um, you can probably guess if you've met Peter, uh, we're a fairly ambitious organization and we said, well, we already did suborbital, let's do something a little harder. Uh, so on the space side, we've expanded, we've done prizes beyond space, and I'm happy to talk about those, but on the space uh, side, we started focusing on, on this guy, on the moon. Uh, you're a space audience, I don't need to talk to you about Apollo uh, or about its Soviet counterparts. You all know that we've been to the moon before, but you also know that we really haven't seen very much of it. Uh, we've seen a landmass about the size of Manhattan on a landmass that's about the size of Africa and Australia put together. We've just scratched the surface of the moon. This is the Apollo 11 site, translated to a scale that probably makes more sense to some of you. Although, we're not a lot of sports fans and sets, I found out, so maybe we <laughs> There are a million and one reasons for why we should go back to the moon. That would be a whole other presentation. I'm going to put it into five minutes. But you guys have more already. We're still doing original science on the samples returned from then. Uh, that has left certainly all of us in this room and a lot of people in the general public, not just here in the United States, but around the world, wondering when the hell are we going back? Apollo is awesome. I love the people who did it. It's, it's Soviet equivalents, also awesome. Uh, I wanted Apollo for this generation. And I wanted it to actually be going to the moon, not like all those people who say energy is the new Apollo. Like, the energy is cool. But I want to actually go back to the moon. I want the answer to that question, what are we going back to be soon and often, right? Not just going to the next And we think at the foundation that private enterprise has a role to play in that. Not the only role, government space, awesome, very important. I love NASA, my wife works there. I'd be in big trouble if I didn't love NASA. Uh, but uh, commercial enterprise can help make that answer soon and help make it often. Uh, we think prizes can be play a role in that. So we've done now two different prizes that are moon related. One, we did in partnership with NASA, the $2 million Martha Grumman Moon Lander X Challenge. You probably all have heard a little bit about this from Ben Brockert's talk earlier in the week. Uh, maybe you were watching online on our webcast. But we offered up this $2 million prize to test here on Earth the type of the vehicles of kind of the caliber that you could eventually use to go from the lunar surface uh, to lunar orbit or vice versa. Uh, we had uh, a dozen different companies register. I think seven of those teams flew a rocket vehicle. Um, really only two vehicles of that category had ever been flown in, in history. Uh, and we got to give out some checks, right? This was, cool. this was actually, much to my amazement, it was voted the NASA top story of 2009 on the NASA website by members of the general public, which was pretty cool. Uh, it's triggered off a lot of new business. It's gotten people jobs, or in Ben's case, different jobs. <laughs> uh, and they're now doing cool things, some of which are related to the moon, but a lot of which are not. Uh, so that was fun. 
by testing stuff here on the Earth, as exciting as it is to go out to New Mexico and Mojave, uh, we want to actually send stuff to the lunar surface. So in 2007, we kicked off the Google Lunar X Prize. At $30 million, this is the largest international incentive prize ever offered. Uh, and incentive prizes go back at least to the 1700s. Uh, someone told me recently that there's one in the Bible, so I guess they go back even longer than that. <laughs> this is the biggest one in cash value. Uh, to win, it's pretty easy. All one has to do is uh, privately build and launch a robot, land on the lunar surface, have it move around for a half a kilometer, and send back about uh, 20 minutes of HD video. Quite simple, pretty, pretty easy. Uh, straightforward, at least. Um, like I said, we announced it in 2007. Uh, we're about to start uh, stop accepting new teams, uh, but uh, as of right now, we have 24, 24 groups, uh, including groups started by undergraduate students. Think about that for a second. This is a map of all the countries, excuse me, that are involved in the Google Lunar X Prize. Obviously, if I had showed this map in Apollo era, there would have been two countries built in. Our 24 teams are based in a dozen different countries, but most of them are massively multinational. So we actually have team members working in 70 different countries or so. Uh, and again, as great as Apollo was, uh, Apollo was a bunch of white guys. And as a white guy, I think white guys are pretty smart. Uh, we, don't have, we don't have a monopoly on it. Let's let other people contribute to the workforce as well. Uh, and we've got that in spades in this program. Uh, the big question for everyone is, what is the business plan for uh, Lunar Services? I can go into that in detail, and I'm more than happy to in my question and answers. Uh, suffice it to say, NASA has already stepped up into a very strong leadership role. They announced a program called Innovative Lunar Demonstrations Data Program, through which they're purchasing $30 million in data from our team, or from anyone, which happens to be our teams, at least at this point in time. Uh, a, a consulting company by Futron, who some of you may recognize, did sort of the seminal space tourism study, talking about the size of that market, uh, which seems to be bearing out pretty well. Uh, estimated the size of the commercial lunar services market at about $1.5 billion over the course of the next decade. Um, so we think that there's a lot of money there, enough to make our $30 million really look like nothing. Uh, we're also using this prize as a big educational thing, and you saw um, a slide that I've already missed, because these are really going very fast. Um, there's a lot of cool educational projects. Most of them now are no longer aimed at students your age, they're aimed at students younger than you all because we discovered you all were studying the Google Lunar X Prize anyway. Uh, a lot of you have done it, I know, as a senior design project or at least as a question on an exam or something like that. So, so that's cool. And then at the end you saw my staff. We're great. Thank you to my staff for not here. Okay. That was fast. Of you in the audience and the students and the SEDs, 
Uh, when I was a student, 25, that was like an age that I could rock, right? That I, could, I could understand what it was to be 25. I could maybe understand what it was to be 30. Uh, when I was a student, if you were older than 30, you may as well have been a different species. It just didn't, it didn't make sense to me. Um, but I'm not really going to focus my, my thought, uh, my talk here tonight on, uh, I'm going to try and like get you guys fired up, even though your sets here are already pretty fired up. But I'm going to try and get you fired up um, in a different way. Uh, so I've, talk, I've, I've titled my talk, um, You Two Can Kick Ass in the Space Industry by Age 30. <laughs>
really kick ass, not just have a job, you should be doing more than 90%. You should be doing more than 100%. You should be doing probably a lot more than 100%. So you should be going out, you should be finding projects. They don't have to be technical projects. They don't have to be stuffy academic projects, although they are welcome to be. You should be finding projects that inspire you, that tax you, that push your abilities, that, uh, that, that just get that intellectual curiosity that I know exists in all of your brains or you wouldn't be at this conference, that, that stimulates that center of your brain. Uh, that gets you learning. And Ben listed off some specific examples. I think there were some great ones. Uh, but there are a lot of them. Go out and do them. As Ben said, I, I'm in a hiring position as well. I have been for a while. I'm in a scholarship uh, granting position as well. Uh, the vast majority of students don't do those things. Right? Maybe they're in a club or two. But really they do what other people ask them to do and tell them to do. <laughs> <laughs> This is in case the talk is going really badly. <laughs> but, but most people, just do what other people tell you. Don't be those people. Go, go out and do, do other things. But, but even at a, at a more fundamental level than do stuff, and it's kind of hard to get more fundamental than do stuff, but, but care. Care. Give a crap about what you're doing. Right? If you don't care passionately about space exploration, Get a new major and get a new job. This is not the field for you. Right? This, is a, this is the kind of field that people who will never work a day in are passionate zealots about. There are millions of people in this country and abroad who think space is the most kick-ass, awesome thing ever and will never work a day in it. So if you're going to be in this industry, you should think this is a kick-ass industry. If not, really, I'm not judging you, you're not a bad person, but you can find another job that will be more rewarding for you, that will pay you more, that will demand less. There, there are other things that you can do with your time that will be better for you and better for us. If you're here, be passionate about it. And, and again, I don't just mean that in the sense of be a Trekkie, although that's great, be a Trekkie, be a Trekkie school. Uh, <laughs> if you care passionately about what you do, you will do stuff. Right? The two go together. I have been shocked since I graduated the amount of times where I've been at a meeting or on a teleconference where everyone in the room knows that there's a problem. Everyone in the room knows that there's a need, but it's not exactly someone's responsibility. There's not a stucky. And you go around the room and say, who's going to fix this? And you could hear crickets stripping. It happens all the time. It even happens at places where there are kick-ass employees. Like NASA people are great. They're brilliant. There are a lot of dedicated people. But I've been in meetings at NASA where everyone says, we need, someone needs to do this. There's a problem. We've identified a flaw, but it's not my job, so I will wait until someone else does it. Don't be that guy. Don't be that girl. Don't do that. If you stick your head out and you take some risk, and that's basically the next thing on my list, if you are willing to be ambitious and, uh, and take on a project that's outside of your comfort zone, you will succeed more often than you fail, and that is the path to kicking ass in the space industry. Again, I know a lot of people who work at NASA, who work at the big companies, who work at the small companies, who are good at their jobs, but who do what is asked of them and then leave. And that's fine. They have good lives, they earn good salaries, but they're not the ones on these slides. So my goal is by the end of the, if you haven't already, by the end of this presentation, you will want one of the on these slides. Uh, and I think to do that, you have to stick your neck out. You have to take some risk. You have to fail. Um, and you guys are actually, those of you who are students, uh, you guys are graduating, or going to graduate, at a really amazing, fantastic time. Right? What a phenomenally interesting time to be entering the workforce in the aerospace business. What an absolutely interesting time. Compared to people who graduated 10 years before you, where there wasn't a whole lot going on, there were not a whole lot of opportunities for you to take risks, because there were a couple big monolithic programs that had enormous workforces behind them, uh, and there wasn't a lot of roles for young people to get in a position of ownership and responsibility. Right now, there is a hell of a lot of risk, right? Nobody, the most brilliant uh, Miss Cleo couldn't tell you what's happening with NASA next year. <laughs> and some people are going to guess wrong. And some people, great people who have been working hard for years, are going to be on the short end of that stick. But there are these real opportunities for you to place a bet on a project, on a company, on a startup, on a field of the industry that you think is important. Uh, and if you get lucky and you uh, if you strike oil, as it were, uh, it's really going to pay off. And if it doesn't, I think it's still going to be pretty damn interesting for you, if you care about what you're doing and if you're working hard. So, so don't be afraid um, to take risks. Uh, I'll tell you one thing that you don't need to do, 
uh, is have a good GPA. It doesn't hurt, obviously. But uh, my advice to you as students, uh, so like I said, I'm 30, I've been in the industry, in the workforce for eight years now. Since I graduated, I've been asked my GPA twice. It doesn't matter that much, right? Don't fail out. Probably get a degree, although as we don't necessarily have to, we have some case studies of that. But don't stress out about it too much. When I'm hiring someone, uh, I don't look at the GPA. I look at what they've done. I look at, can they hold a, com a conversation? Can they explain something in a, in a good way? Or do they have any personal skills? Do they work on a team? Do they care about what they're doing? Do they put the attention into the resume and the interview process that they're going to put the attention into their job? Uh, do they do stuff? Are they going to be the one who sits on their hands and says, well, there's a problem, but it's not my job? Or are they going to be the one who says, how can I help? Um, I'm not going to ask you your GPA. There are some things, if you want to go into academia, that matters. If you want to go to business school, it probably matters. So, again, don't neglect your studies, but don't stress out about that too much. If your GPA, if you guys are halfway through school and your GPA ain't all that great, that, that, don't let that stop you. That is not, you don't need to stop you. Uh, you can let it stop you, I, I recommend that you don't. Um, another thing not to do, uh, don't be dissuaded when you graduate and you're job hunting and every cool sounding job out there says five years experience required. Because that's what they all say, at least that was what they all said a couple years ago when I was looking. They all said five years, and I'm saying, where the, where the hell do I get the, I don't know, spork? <laughs> <laughs> where the gosh darn heck do I get the <laughs> cool job at NASA headquarters. They're hiring a GS-15, which if that means nothing to you, um, is a, a person who not only has, I don't know, 10 or 15 years of experience in, in a related field in the industry, um, to, to run the NASA Centennial Challenge program. I think it's going to be an awesome job. A super, super cool job. And I had um, one or two people in their 40s and 50s write to me and say, well, I don't technically meet the requirements because my degree is in the wrong field, so I'm not going to I said, really? Then you don't deserve the job. Like, I'm sorry, I don't mean to be mean. This is a job that requires an out-of-the-box thinker to do something new that NASA's never done before, that's just starting to do. If you read one line and you are so discouraged that you're not willing to make a phone call and send in a resume, again, find a different industry, find a different job. Uh, don't be discouraged by that. People put that on there because they're trying to winnow down the number of resumes that they get. That, that's why people do it, at least in my experience. People correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, if you bust your butt and you're ambitious and you send stuff in and you explain why you have experience that's equivalent to five years, you can still get the job, 99% of the time. Sometimes it's legally mandated and there are requirements and you won't get every percent of it. You will never get in trouble for asking. You will never piss someone off. You will never get blacklisted because you ask for a job that you are doing the paper not qualified for. If anything, they're going to remember you as an ambitious person, a driven person, a person who cares. It's going to reflect on you. Uh, very well. All right, that's enough don't do. I like the dude. The dude. <laughs> <laughs> Done something wrong, 
my recommendation to you is because when you come to a conference like this, and certainly when you start going to other, when you go to AAAs, when you go to big conferences that are full of awesome professional people, uh, you'll probably do what I did when I was a student, was I collected a bunch of business cards, I threw them all in this pocket, at the end of the day in the hotel, I'd dump them all out, and I would go to maybe, maybe if I was really, really ambitious, I'd go to type them into my computer and I would say, who the hell is this person? <laughs> right, I met so many people today, I vaguely remember, I talked to five people from Boeing, and I liked one of them, but which one was it? I, I don't you won't recall tonight, you definitely won't recall next week, and you certainly won't recall two years from now when you're looking for a job. So my recommendation to you is take that business card, turn it over, right on the back. I met Will Pomerantz at Space Vision at 2010 in Illinois. He gave a talk. I thought this was interesting. I thought this was funny. We talked about this afterwards. And that way, when you want a job from me a couple of years from now, uh, or something like that, and you want me to hand you a big multi-million dollar check, uh, and you send me an email, you can say, hey, I haven't talked to you in a while, but we met at Space Vision 2010. And I might not remember you, but I remember, oh, Space Vision, that was a great conference. A lot of hardworking, cool young men and women. I like them all, so now I like you. <laughs> that, that is the association that people make. I don't remember them, but they prompted me. My only memory is now favorable, and you have just started this conversation on pitch fighting, and it's like we know each other, at least a little bit. You're not cold calling me anymore. So that, that's, a, that's a big tip that I have. Uh, another one, and uh, someone reminded me to include this, I think maybe it was Brad, uh, reminded me to include this, uh, don't be afraid to ask for money. Um, if you want to do a startup, you guys are creative, right? Your students, this is, you are towards the peak of your intellectual creativity. You probably come up with business ideas and technology ideas um, every day, every homework assignment, every time you get frustrated by something stupid that someone asks you to do that you wish you didn't have to do. Uh, some of those are good ideas, some of them are bad ones. There's one really good way to figure out and that's to try it, to take it to market. Uh, and I know I was uh, about 26 before I got on the nerve to actually try something. E even though I had found out before that, that I did care and I did want to do stuff, but I would say, you know what, if this is a good idea, someone would have done it already, and what do I know about business? I have a science major, and, um, and I really hate asking people for money. Like, I can't ask my friends for money. I try to buy drinks for people all the time. I just can't do it. If you can't do it, learn to do it, or may find a partner who will learn to do it. Again, it doesn't hurt to ask people for money. Um, the first time I met Peter Diamandis, I asked him for $10,000, and now I work for him. Right? It's, he didn't think I was a jerk because I asked him for money. In fact, he was the one giving me the talk saying, don't be afraid to ask for money, and I, I listened. <laughs> so $10,000 like an hour later. <laughs> but he helped me get money from other people, and, and, and that's how I got, that's how I was able to afford to go to IC. So don't, don't be afraid to ask for money. I can get to the end of my, uh, my list here. Um, Another one, and this betrays the fact that I went to ISU, be interdisciplinary, at least a little bit, right? Engineering is awesome. I, I learned yesterday that you are all engineers. There's like two scientists and a business person and an artist here or something, right? <laughs> 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 kind of history thing. Someone. Some anonymous person in the room. Okay. Um, engineering is, is really cool. It's fun. If I were starting undergrad again, I would probably be an engineer. But uh, engineering... Uh, without those other disciplines is pretty useless, right? The scientists often are your customers. Uh, you need the business people to give you the startup capital you need to buy material, or I think I added the slide later, I forgot to make the audience. Um, you need the business people, you even, yes, need lawyers. It's sad, but it is true. Um, <laughs> you will find, I found, and I guess you will find, when you enter the industry, most engineers, and it's equally true of scientists, have no idea to talk to people outside their discipline. You can lock engineers and scientists in a room and it, it is like the Civil War or something. Because the engineers are looking for this elegant solution to the problem and if I have to lose all the sensors to get it, whatever, who really cares about the sensors? This is such a beautiful spacecraft that I made. And the scientists are like, I want a hundred different data sets and I want them all within the first 30 seconds of landing and, and who cares if that would cost a kajillion dollars, your engineers figure it out, you work in NASA, they work in <laughs> <laughs> you, you figure it out, right? You have to learn the 101, you have to learn, just like when you are traveling to a foreign country and you have to learn, yes, please, no, thank you, and where's the bathroom, you, you have to learn that level of competency in every other language. You don't have to be the best business person and the best lawyer, but learn how to talk to those people, learn how to make them care about what you do, learn how to figure out if what is absolutely fundamentally impossible, learn the difference between a project that's going to cost a trillion dollars and the project that's going to cost a thousand dollars. You don't have to write a business plan to do that. 
Um, and that is something I was never taught in school until I went to ISU. It was something I was never taught in undergrad. I never once, I, I, you know, I was a science major. I was at a school that doesn't really have an engineering uh, program very much, a very small one. But I never talked to an engineer. I was never told to take an engineering class. I never did a group project with an engineer. I was never in an engineering club. So I had a completely baseless, biasless, or uh, baseless, excuse me, viewpoint of what engineering was. And I did, all I knew was the miracles that NASA and others achieve. So surely any data set I can dream up, you can get for me, because that's what you do. You are magic engineers, and you go off in the back room. Where's your magic program? So that's uh, how I did it. I'm going to slides up. And I'm going to fill time. Some of them mentioned these people earlier. Um, you can find lots of ways to do these interesting things. You can, I would be not doing my enterprise job well if I didn't recommend that you all compete in competitions or that you host competitions on your own. It's a great way to identify uh, flaws in the industry, areas where you can fit in. If someone's offering a prize for something, that means that nobody knows how to do it well enough. So if you're looking for where you could start a company or at least get a job, pretty good identifier, right? There's a, that, that function. Have worked for some of our prize teams can tell you is, is an important one. Uh, a lot of these competitions are being viewed by the big companies as uh, as a breeding ground for talent and a breeding ground for ideas. And it's not a coincidence. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the last final one. Uh, it's not a coincidence that Scale Composites, the company that uh, won our first prize, was a part of our program. Not just because their prize technology scale has been doing awesome things well before they won the next prize, but that it didn't hurt. Uh, I know that for a fact. There are people, um, there's a great story. Some of you I know were at the X-Prize Cups the previous years and were following the Liverliner Challenge, and, and not just Armadillo and Mastiff, but the other teams. Uh, we had this uh, cool team. It was the second team ever to fly a vehicle uh, in competition, a company called True Zero. It was basically a two engineer team. It was like two engineers and two guys who owned a, a machine shop. Um, a mechanical engineer and electrical engineer, as I recall, and, and they had never built a rocket before, but they were the type of people who like to do stuff. Right? They cared and they like to do stuff. So they had they just do projects in their garage. They had just finished building an electric car, and uh, one of them read about uh, a close call, but ultimately failed attempt by Armadillo, and about the Lunar Liner Challenge, and said, "That sounds cool. You know how hard can building a rocket be?" <laughs> uh, and so went from uh, December of '07, having never thought about building a rocket, to October of '08, flying a rocket in front of an audience. So they didn't win, but that was pretty spectacular to go from no experience base, no knowledge base, no specific experience base, no knowledge base, uh, no equipment, nothing, piggybacking on the designs of others, uh, and to be flying, um, to be flying a rocket in front of an audience. You know, nine months later, whatever it was. Um, and those guys got invited to go out and give a talk at Scale Composites to the Spaceship One team, and they thought that was the coolest thing ever. Because in their mind, there were still just these two guys from Chicago who did cool projects. And what they didn't know was the reason that they were brought out, being brought out to give a brown bag lunch thing is because they were all going to get job offers. They were both going to get job offers. So, so you never know when you start doing one of these projects where it's going to lead. Uh, you will percolate to the top, and you will become, become visible, I think, in a lot of ways that or not be your original intentions. Uh, all right, that's pretty much done here. Oh, uh, another Google Lunar X-Prize team, founded by a 22-year-old. That's like almost offensive to me. That's a very Google Lunar X-Prize team at 22. I, I never would have thought of that, but I, I know that, that you here would have, Paul Reed, I think I never you know, this is the, the younger, he's not Paul Jr., he's Paul T, Paul A, never remember which is which. He's flying cool rockets in his, in his uh, early 20s. And this guy now has a startup, and he's building the rocket for is it Bloodhound, the, the car that's trying to break the land speed record, and he's building, helping build the rocket part of it. The startup is valued at $6 million uh, last yeah. time I asked for about it, so I didn't even know that yet. <laughs> his, his, his dad is kind of annoyed about it in the same way. Like, <laughs> <laughs> it took me to like 30 to make my first million dollars, and he's not good in his early 20s. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and Paul's a great example because I think. I think when he started doing this, he was, I want to say he was a sophomore in college. Uh, didn't like that at his, at his university he was doing all, you know, CAD and, and computer-based engineering, which is important, I'm not going to knock it, but he wasn't doing any hands-on stuff. And he said, well, this is dumb, I can do cooler stuff in my dad's garage. And he actually meant it, and so he dropped out, and he, 
had since started school again, or maybe he's left for all I know, but he, he dropped out and he went home and he started doing stuff with his dad with flying rockets. And, and they kind of similarly to the team I just described, we have been just a, you know, in a year from having never thought about rockets to joining AAA to flying high powered air for rockets to flying the Lunar Energy Challenge. And they're, and they're an inspiration to me and, and to a lot, other, a lot of other people, right? I can't hear. This is going to go through this really fast. I like this one. <laughs> <laughs>
And generally speaking, those are teams that are not based in the United States and they have totally different labor costs. Um, but most of our teams think that they can do it in the 50 to 75 million dollar range. So they're talking about lunch costs not being the only driver, a big portion not the only driver of their expense. Um, a cool development that we had fairly recently is that now a lot of our teams are talking about sharing a ride. Um, there is uh, our newest, one of our newest teams called the Rocket City Space Pioneers, one of our two teams based in Huntsville. Um, one of their, they're a big consortium, they're built around Dynetics and all these other companies, and one of the companies is, uh, that's what this company now is doing, they're partnered with SpaceX, and they're basically carving up and reselling Falcon 9 launches, uh, and so they think that they can pretty comfortably carry uh, four, five, maybe six payloads um, on a lunar insertion ride. Uh, so that to me would be awesome, I mean, as a guy who doesn't have to deal with the meeting uh, where they decide who gets dispatched first, deployed first, uh, that would be the coolest story of all time. I think you get six independently built spacecraft and like this flotilla. Of <laughs> 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 and that's cool with us, you know, if they, if they can work that out. So it'll be interesting to see uh, at a broader level how our team's getting money uh, a variety of ways. Uh, we, uh, to clear up some confusion, we do place limits on government funding, uh, but we have, we have always and we will always draw a very clear distinction between government as funder, which we're not looking for in this prize, and government as customer, which we absolutely are looking for in this prize. Um, so we already have programs like ILBD and other government programs in the United States and abroad where governments are signing up to be customers of these teams, some, and sometimes on their initial mission, in other cases on subsequent missions. Um, so a lot of them are offsetting launch costs with revenue that's earned from customers. They're also looking at donations, almost all of them. Uh, they're all looking at corporate sponsorships. And that's a cool angle that uh, NASA is not legally able to. You know, I'm sure Coca-Cola would happily pay a really large amount of money to pay to pay Coca-Cola to go on the side of the space shuttle, especially on these upcoming launches. But NASA can't can't do that. Uh, one of our teams can, uh, and I think that could be potentially pretty lucrative. It's going to be a big deal. We've already gotten something like uh, 5.6 billion media impressions for this prize, and, and we're still a couple years away from being won. So a lot of people are going to be exposed to a brand. So uh, they're looking at all those things and. and It's a good question. So we uh, we started in 2007, September 2007, and we thought we were probably getting into a seven-year effort. We were uh, ambitious that it would happen sooner. And one thing, one detail I didn't get to is, unlike the first NSRA prize, this is not a winner take all. We actually have a second place prize for the second team to do exactly the same thing. We have a series of bonuses that either of the two winners can claim. So we were initially hopeful that the first prize would be won in 11, 2011, and that the second place prize would be won in 15 or 14. Um, we didn't realize at the time that we were announcing this prize three months before the worst recession since the Great Depression. Uh, and that has obviously slowed things down. I won't try and pretend like it hasn't, but it hasn't stopped anything. Um, we have uh, extended the deadline, which was originally the end of 2014, we've extended by one year, partly uh, in response to that global recession, which really isn't our team's fault. Uh, partly because of some delays that we've had. We actually uh, are about a year behind in getting our teams a finalized contract for them to sign. We don't want to penalize them, that, them for that either. Um, it won't be one in 2010. It won't be one in 2011. Probably won't be one in 12, but it's possible. Um, after that, I think it starts to get pretty likely. Yeah? Um, how many layers did you have your guess before the three lots, and how many have? Um, <laughs> A lot and none. They all have been stolen from me. Uh, Lego is an awesome partner in that program called Moonbots. It was a really, really fun one, and we're hoping we can do it again. We partnered um, not only XPRIZE and, and Google, but we partnered with Lego uh, with a Texas company called National Instruments. Uh, they write the LabVIEW programming software, among, among many other products, uh, and Wired Magazine to do that, and they all generously sort of kicked in to underwrite the cost of that. Um, if you aren't familiar with Moonbots, this was basically we were asking um, middle school and high school student teams to win the Google Learner Prize with Legos. Uh, so they had to first use uh, free software programs like Google SketchUp or Lego Digital Designer, which are basically kind of CAD for kids, to do a CAD of a robot. We, uh, they also had to do blogging and YouTube stuff. Um, and then we picked 20 finalists. We sent them each about $500 worth of Lego. They had to build a uh, 
two meter by two meter lunar surface and a lunar robot and do a live webcast of their lunar mission. Uh, it was a totally awesome project. The kids blew us away. Uh, they, the first lesson that we learned is we originally announced it where um, you had to be at least 13 to join and we actually just got our office set on fire by nine year olds. <laughs> <laughs> So jealous. The grand prize was the winning team got to fly to Denmark to Lego headquarters, meet the CEO, and do the factory tour. And I was like, please tell me you need a chaperone. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I have motivation to do it again next year. But uh, yeah, now I think I have a couple of Legos in my office, but they all got basically thrown into a big bucket that's in my education manager's office. Sadly. I think, Aaron, did you have a question? No. Anyone else? Questions? Yes, please. So, uh, before the end of the Lunar X Prize, are there likely to be any more space-related X Prizes? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think there there will be more. Timing difficult to say, um, and um, let me address a distinction. We now talk. Um, as Ben can tell you, we've done some retro retcon uh, branding of that prize. It's the North Carolina Lunar Hunter X Challenge. We have the X in there. And the reason we've done that is because we now we now do prizes in kind of two classes. We have X prizes, which are ten million dollars plus, and generally speaking, are three to seven years. And we have X challenges, which are half a million dollars to two and a half million dollars in our two-ish years. Uh, I think there will certainly be some X challenges in the not too distant future. Um, those are, since I'm talking to engineers, I think I can comfortably say those are more system prizes than system of system prizes. Maybe is a decent way to explain it. Um, and I think we definitely will be doing more of those. X prizes, we have a couple ideas. I'm happy to share with you um, what our current thoughts are. I'm not promising these, they're not in it. We're not announcing them tomorrow. I promise I'm not lying. But, but these are the ones that we're thinking about. Um, one is, I'm really interested in, um, I think we can do a prize that is, uh, finds the, the technological intersection between the types of technologies you need to do uh, orbital debris cleanup and the kinds of technologies <coughs> you need to do um, asteroid docking and rendezvous. I think those are, when you reduce them to base principles, those overlap for uh, a fairly long time in kind of the technical development spectrum, if you will. Um, and that would be a great prize, because prizes are most effective when there are multiple business cases that teams can pursue after winning. And I think that would be a clear example. So I'm not sure exactly what that prize would be. If either of those are your specialty, and I know that's true of you, some of the we've talked about it, but we'd love your, your suggestions and advice. Um, the other one that we're looking at, uh, that is more of Peter's favorite, um, is uh, at a radically new launch technology. You, you guys all know the cost per kilogram of putting something in orbit is essentially unchanged from Sputnik. In fact, by some metrics, it's gone up a little bit. We want to see, we think that there are enough smart people working on chemical rocketry that it's been done about as cheaply as it can be done. Uh, so we want to see, is there something different? And there are these technologies called uh, some people call it beam power propulsion, other people call it directed energy propulsion. Uh, it's sort of, this is not at all technically accurate, but it is a conceptual way to think about it. It's sort of like a hybrid between a conventional rocket and a space elevator, where you are beaming either a high power microwave or laser to a vehicle that has a working fluid on it that you're expelling like a rocket. So you have half of your power you're on ground and half of it uh, on your vehicle. And, and that allows you to get at least a big chunk of your energy off the electrical grid. Uh, and from lasers and microwaves, which are on Moore's Law curve for uh, efficiency versus time. Uh, so those are kind of the two big areas that we're looking at now, but we are always open to suggestions, and pretty much without fail, we get our best suggestions at conferences and from people writing in. So if you have suggestions, uh, please find me and get my business card up in yours. Yes, please. What's the latest in the, in the XPRIZE of genomics? So we have a $10 million prize called the Archon X Prize, Archon Genomics X Prize. Um, in brief summary, that is uh, it's a $10 million prize for the first company to sequence 100 complete human genomes in 10 days or fewer for $10,000 or less, with I think four nines of accuracy. Um, you guys are so young, you probably you might not even remember the first time we sequenced a human genome. It was off six years ago or something. <laughs> if you were paying attention to that, you probably remember that the media articles around that time basically said, like, human genome sequence, world changed forever, disease eradicated. Right? There, there was <laughs> as, as the media sometimes does. Um, and that, you guys have taken statistics. You know a, a data set of one 
sample size of one is not terribly useful. It's a lot more useful than zero, but it's not very useful. <laughs> uh, so we think that in the future, when you get your genome sequenced uh, at birth or in your annual physical, that's when we're going to get the data sets that allow us to say, I have this gene sequence that means that I am likely to manifest a disease or to respond well to a treatment or to respond poorly to a treatment. That, that happens when you have data sets and things like that. So we know the cost has to come down. When we announced the prize, we were looking for about a three order of magnitude improvement in cost, in speed, and in accuracy. Um, no, it's, not, it's not three orders of magnitude improvement in accuracy, but, but in the others, and a lot of improvement in accuracy. Um, and we have seen at least a single order of magnitude has happened in the last couple of years. Uh, so progress is being made. The price doesn't get talked about very often because it's not, for lack of a better word, sexy. You know, I can show videos of rockets and rovers, and the car guys had all the imagery that you could ever want for people to drool over, and the genome prize has, like, computers and white lab coats, and that's not <laughs> quite as compelling television, yeah, although equally worthy, certainly. Um, so it's not in the public eye as much, but it is happening. A problem that we're having with that are difficulties. There isn't really a good standard for uh, what accuracy is required uh, or for um, how to accurately detect accuracy. I mean, what we don't want to have to do is have a team say, we sequence these genomes at 99.9% .9 accuracy, and for us to go, okay, to verify that, we're going to go to your competitors and say, did they really do this? Uh, you can see how that might not work very well. So we've been trying to find another way to do it that isn't prohibitively expensive since the first genome the sequence cost a billion dollars. Um, so that's been difficult, but we're getting there. They're, um, uh, I'm not sure what I'm to say about that. Want somebody to say in there? <laughs> we're getting there. It's, there's a All right, we're, let me roll out of time. All right, I'm being yanked up to say. So thank you again.